And I think what the market's missing is uh, they are not focusing on something called Wright's Law. Wright's Law is a relative of Moore's Law. Moore's Law is a function of time. Wright's Law is a function of units. And it says for every cumulative doubling in the number of units produced, costs decline at a consistent rate. These are massive deflationary trends um, evolving all at the same time. So we're going to see S-curves feeding S-curves, and I think we'll see it in space especially. Innovation solves problems. We had a lot of problems through the coronavirus. Innovation solves problems. We were rewarded accordingly. Since then, peak to trough, when we hit our trough, thank goodness we're past it, down 75%. Why? Inflation and interest rates. So there is this, and it's really interesting to be here, um, Walmart territory, because I think we're learning a lot from the retailers now. And we're talking about what we learned about inventories. Inventories, right. yes. Uh, so the fear of rising interest rates uh, and inflation out of control has gripped the market. And of course, and, and that's the equity market. If you look at the fixed income market, it does not agree with this. Yeah. The three year, I mean, the 10 year treasury bond yield is 3%. Uh, that, that instrument should be one of the most responsive to inflation fears, right? So 3%, which suggests GDP growth 3 to 4% during the next 10 years. So it's not being corroborated by the fixed income markets. And I don't think I don't think that we are in an, a period where we can't extricate ourselves from this. In fact, the inventory stories are a very good example of why, of why inflation has become a problem. You know, the scrambling to bring more and more inventory to satisfy demand, stay-at-home demand, went into overdrive. And I believe the narrative in the last year, inflation, uh, gave purchasing managers this idea that, okay, what's the worst that could happen if I build inventories? The worst that could happen is that I'm able to deliver inventory profits, sell at a higher price. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I, I think it is uh, uh, seeping into the investor's mind is, wait a minute, are we right on this inflation call? They felt so right. Uh, because supply chain issues uh, extended for such a long time, then Russia invades Ukraine, you know, of course, and of course, monetary and fiscal policy had been so stimulative. But as I've said many times, we think the greatest ris greater risk by far is deflation. Deflation cyclically, because I think this inventory issue highlights the cyclical reason we've been saying we think inflation will unravel. The secular deflation story is very powerful. And, and, and as EVs and uh, uh, autonomous mobility of all stripes starts becoming a bigger base in the economy, that deflationary pull is going to be aggregated. Because again, these are convergences between and among right. different technologies that are all on their own deflationary cost curves. Since OpenAI released Dolly 2, found foundation model in AI, that service has gone from flat, when, when do you think artificial, artificial general intelligence will occur? It's been flat for the last two years, but since those two models have come out, um, the, the time that, that these forecasters expect to see uh, artif uh, artificial general intelligence has shrunk from 30 to 50 years to 6 to 12 years. So it sounds impossible to think that GDP growth, sort of that 3% 3, 3 uh, in real terms and so forth, uh, is going to accelerate to 30%. But if you look at the history over thousands of years, you will see that at one point in time, GDP in the economy, now this is thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. I wasn't around then, so I, yeah. <laughs> Who's to say we aren't close? I just mentioned these S-curves feeding one another, and, and the market's not being set up for it, you know, really looking to the past for an indication of where we're going in the future. It's going to be a real blindside for some. Well, I think people have been saying that uh, all along with Tesla because of SpaceX. Right, and of split course, in his boring, uh, And Neuralink. And, I mean, he is our renaissance man. But it has ramped up quite a lot, hasn't it? It has. It has. But he has, you know, as you scale a Tesla, they've got that manufacturing scaling under control now. The next 
challenge there and what he is, I think, sticking around for. He doesn't need to stick around for the EV side of it. He needs to stick around for the autonomous side. So he and Andre Karpathy together. So let's bring it back to artificial intelligence. Yes. Why is that important? Why does he need to stick around because, for that? Because uh, for Tesla and, any, and cruise automation and Waymo, this is the biggest transportation opportunity out there. It is, a, as I mentioned before, think about this, $10 trillion in revenue versus zero now by 2030, right? And that's ARC's full case or still base case scenario. That's our base case scenario. Okay. Uh, nine to $10 trillion in revenues. So I don't think we've seen a bigger opportunity for one, and it's not just one sector. Again, there's a convergence going on between and among technologies and sectors. Autonomous taxi networks are, you know, they're robotics, energy storage, and artificial intelligence. Right. Right? So. Tesla, what's so fascinating is the retail investor interest, and there's a potential another stock split on the horizon. Can you just give your opinion on that, about, you know, the, the Tesla sort of monumental gain, the issue of stock split, and then more people trying to have ownership of that stock? Well, I think, uh, you know, retail was there way before institutional. And see, this is a perfect example of what's gone wrong. Uh, many institutions couldn't even think about uh, putting Tesla in uh, their portfolios until it got into an index. It got into an index when it was $500 billion. Think about all of the alpha generation that institutions made uh, uh, left on the table, but retail investors enjoyed. I think retail investors are feeling empowered. They know more about the future than institutions do, and they know we're doing the right work. And so I, I think that's why they were there early, and they will be early into everything we're doing, uh, because they really love to learn. And they're a part of the future. They have one foot in the new world. They're going to make it. So they're excited about it. So, and they are willing to put up, I've been shocked, how many, how many people, and it's not just young people, but come, come up to me and say, we're down 75%. They say, thank you. And I'm saying, whoa, you know, this would not happen. Uh, of course, they enjoyed the big gains uh, before that uh, because they are long-term in their time horizon. They are long-term. They really believe we are on to something big. Um, it's not fair that we are blocking these young people, uh, most who don't have the income or asset thresholds, because they're not accredited, so they don't get access to innovation. So we're trying to change that, again, closest to a, pub, uh, a venture capital fund in the, in the public equity market.